Hey everyone. In this video, I want to talk about Azure Stack HCI. If we think about Azure today, Azure has regions all over the world. So I could think about, hey, we have that great Azure cloud with all of its different capabilities. That could be VMs at the most basic level. We see things like AKS for Kubernetes. There's data services, app services, IoT services. List goes on. And we use regions. And there's regions literally all over the world. And I'll pick a region based on where I'm using the service from. So maybe I get a certain lower latency, maybe certain data sovereignty. I use multiple ones for resiliency against regional level impacts. So you have the Azure clouds all over the place with all their different capabilities. And then we have the Azure Resource Manager. So the Azure Resource Manager is the Azure control plane. So any interaction I'm doing with regards to the resources flow through Azure Resource Manager. PowerShell, CLI, Portal, Template, REST API, whatever. And so it's through this control plane where we're doing things like the management. So I get a consistent management no matter what type of resource I'm interacting with. The control plane gives us things like inventory. I can have metadata like tags. I can apply policy to put in my governance guardrails. I have role-based access control. I have budget capabilities. I have things like extensions. So for many types of resource, there are extensions to bring certain additional capabilities to that resource. And then Azure itself has other capabilities to help. Obviously there are big ones around things like security, with its various defender solutions. There's monitoring capabilities. The list goes on, you get the idea. So there's a whole set of capabilities around this. And then I've talked about the idea before that, well, what if I have other resources? So I've got some other resource. Now, what that is, we don't really know, but I want to bring Azure capabilities, I want to bring elements of the control plane to that to get consistency. And we can do that. So I have this capability through Azure Arc to really bring the cloud to wherever those resources actually sit. And that's fantastic, except, well, what is this? What is this question mark? Where am I running Arc on top of the OS on top of the Kubernetes to bring those other capabilities. Now I have talked before about things like Arc enabled uh, vSphere, Arc enabled Hyper-V, but those solutions are really geared towards the workload, i.e. the VM creation, the VM insight, the VM deletion, not the actual Hyper-V or vSphere itself management. I still have to go and use separate tooling if I wanted to do that. So there's a gap in that consistency of our management experience and all of the different capabilities. Well, that's obviously where Azure Stack HCI comes in. So let's scroll this up to give ourselves lots of space. So now we're gonna talk about Azure Stack HCI. Let's do it, which is it orange. Orange is always my new color thing. So we have Azure. Stack. And you've probably heard of Azure Stack. There's different SKUs. There's Azure Stack Hub, there's Azure Stack Edge, and of course Azure Stack HCI. And the whole point of HCI is it's that hyper-converged infrastructure, i.e. all of the components that I think about, networking, storage, compute, are combined into a single unified system. And if I think from a technology perspective for a second, the way this is actually working, it's all geared to around the idea of a software-defined data center.
The software defined data center is what's going to enable all of these capabilities. And we'll see a lot more of that when we actually go into the detail of how this is working. Now, what might be useful from the start is, well, why would I use this? Why would I use the Azure Stack HCI at all when we have Azure? And I'd always think about Azure would be my first choice. Azure in terms of the Azure cloud. That would be my first choice. If I have a solution, I would start off, hey, I want to deploy it here. And then I'd look at the reasons, well, maybe why can't I deploy it here? And so the Azure Stack HCI, I really think of as an edge solution, i.e. it's that edge of my environment. And why I might need it at my edge within my network, my infrastructure, as opposed to the cloud, has a number of key scenarios. So a big one is latency. So if I am latency sensitive, I need to run it closer to me. The cloud, we have express route, we have very efficient networking, but typically I'm still looking at tens of milliseconds of latency in the best case scenarios. And that may not be good enough. There may be scenarios where I need it millisecond latency, or maybe even less in some scenarios. So if I'm super latency sensitive and I can't move all of it to the cloud so they can be close together there, well, I might need it on my edge. There might also be scenarios where there's a certain type of performance that I need. For example, I need a local GPU capability, which again, there are GPU capabilities in the cloud, but I need it near to some scenario and it may be tying into that latency sensitivity as well. There are also software in region. I cannot have this data, this workload taking place where the regular Azure regions are. I have to have it existing in my specific location. That's the only place I can leverage it. And so these would be common reasons, latency, performance, data sovereignty. I need to run it at my edge in my locations as opposed to those uh, Azure cloud regions and locations. And where this solution really shines and what we're really gonna focus on initially, but we'll see how this does grow, obviously virtual machines and things like Azure Kubernetes service, but we're gonna see that Arc lights up everywhere. And so everything Arc can bring data services, app services, machine learning services, that's going to follow onto this Azure Stack HCI solution as well. So it's, don't think of it as just all VMs and Kubernetes. All of these other things will grow with it as well. Okay. So it's focus. When would we use this solution? I wrote edge solution, but I should maybe be more clear in really what that focus is and the true focus of this is a distributed edge solution. That distributed is the key word. What very commonly you're gonna see with Azure Stack HCI and really where it's geared towards is yes, the Azure Stack HCI is gonna be made up of clusters. So we have a certain number of these clusters that we build up. but we're gonna have typically maybe hundreds of them or maybe thousands of them in the solution. I'm not thinking of one huge deployment. It is not replacing a data center. The goal of Azure Stack HCI is not to replace a data center. There were, I mean, if I wanted to just have Microsoft-based virtualization replacing my entire data center, then Windows Server with Hyper-V, I can leverage that. Azure Stack HCI is geared towards tens, hundreds, thousands of these smaller clusters deployed in multiple locations. We think of it as a distributed edge. So when we think about these hundreds and thousands, well, they're going all over the place. They're going here, there, and everywhere. And each of these becomes
an Azure custom location. And we're gonna see everything we're doing is all about this just becoming an extension of Azure. So think if I had hundreds or thousands of these Azure Stack HCIs, maybe two or four node clusters, all throughout everywhere, there'd all be a location within Azure. And now I could do a deployment targeting all of those locations in one management action. I can have a template that targets all of them and I'm just deploying them all in one distributed manner. So I can centrally manage a very distributed environment. And that's the key point of this. The focus is bringing the cloud software, the cloud experiences to your location. And so if I think about, well, why would I want to do this? Where would this be useful? Um, think of retail. I have lots of stores and I could think today I've probably got a whole bunch of servers there that I have trouble managing. I have to remote into each cluster and do specific types of management. I could just replace it with Azure Stack HCI and it's now just centrally managed. Maybe I can reuse the old hardware and do like a rolling hardware, moving it between them to get it upgraded to Azure Stack HCI, replaced with Azure Stack HCI, integrated, or maybe it's part of a hardware refresh. And funny, when I talk about retail, uh, I went shopping yesterday and I was buying multiple healthy salads. It wasn't, it was deep dish pizzas. And I scanned the box, because I had two of them, so I just scanned the same box twice and then put it in the bag and then took the other pizza straight out the basket and put it in the bag. Well, then it kind of alerted. Well, the cashier assistant came over, well, there's a camera and it was using AI and basically detected that I was stealing. I wasn't, I scanned the first box twice, but it detected, well, there's a certain motion going on, a certain behavior and it alerted in real time. So when I checked and saw I bought two of them, I didn't go to jail. But that's a scenario where I think I could have these Azure Stack HCIs at every store. They have the GPUs. We talked about that performance sensitivity. I want the GPUs to do that machine learning, that, that AI capabilities. Also very latency sensitive. It's immediately notifying. Well, I have an Azure Stack HCI cluster at every store would work. Manufacturing the same idea that maybe it's managing the equipment. I can't have any latency, maybe it's safety, maybe it's using again AI vision to detect a, a safety hazard or their sensors. I can't have latency in those things. It, milliseconds make a difference potentially to someone's life. So we put it at our edge so we don't have that latency. It could even be backup. Maybe I lose cloud connectivity Normally I do run from the cloud, but if there was some interruption, well, I have the same workload deployed to my AKS locally, and it could fail over to instances running on the Azure Stack HCI if it failed, and then merge any changes back up when I get that connectivity again. So there's a lot of scenarios where I need edge capability but in those, I don't want an edge separate management solution. The whole goal of everything we wanna do is bring the control plane, the management, and then the capabilities to things that are at our edge. I don't want separation. I don't want different abilities depending on where I am. Okay, so what is it? Well, it's machines you buy. I am buying these machines. So I could think about N number. So I'm just gonna draw two, give myself enough space. I'm gonna draw two big machines. Now I'm drawing two. Um, the reality is it, it's one to 16 nodes, makes up a cluster. Now the exact numbers, the exact flexibility will vary by the partner you leverage but I'm gonna get these certain boxes that so I am buying these boxes. I'm not leasing, this is not Azure Stack Edge where I'm leasing the box. I am going out and I am buying these boxes. So they're my boxes, maybe you're leasing it through a, a partner, whatever that might be, but they're boxes that I am buying and there are different categories. So if we go and look for a second, you have this idea of, well, there's validated nodes, i.e. I'm, really could just go in and get in the boxes. Maybe I'm even doing them myself. They should all be identical. 
and you get a certain amount of capabilities, but I'm gonna be doing separate patching of firmware and BIOSes. Then there are integrated systems. And then there's the highest, which is Premiere. And when we think of Premiere, you can see all the differences. I'll, I'll do the link in the description of the video below. You can really think of those as jointly tested between that partner and Microsoft. Now, one of the things I'll, I'll kind of stress here, I am, normally I try and demo in my own little environments. I am not on this one. I reached out to Dell and they very kindly have given me access to this. And it's not sponsored by Dell, there, there isn't like a, a partnership, but I'm very grateful. They were willing to, again, without any requirements, let me go and play on their boxes so I can show in a bit more detail around this. And obviously Dell are one of the, those big partners. They are at that top level. This is the Apex platform. So this is the new platform that's integrated with Azure. It's these MC nodes deliberately configured PowerEdge servers specifically for the Azure Stack HCI. And when you talk about those partner solutions, Dell and, and others, where it's very closely, they're jointly engineered. If you think the patches, the updates, yes, there's the patches for the Azure Stack HCI OS components, but then it's the firmware, the BIOS, it's all jointly packaged and delivered. And I think it's in like four hours when a new patch is released, it will be available through this. And then different vendors will maybe add on additional capabilities to shine their differentiation capabilities. So you will see some slight differences. Dell, for example, have this virtual appliance, the cloud platform manager that hooks into the Windows admin center that we're gonna see to light up some of their capabilities and again, make it more seamless. So there's different capabilities and there's different categories you can go and buy these boxes. Now what they're gonna have is, remember it's that hyper-converged. So when we talk about the hyper-converged, well they have local storage. So we have local storage in them. They're gonna have a certain networking capabilities in them as well. Now this, that's supposed to be a network card. I don't know what that is. Um, so there's different connectivity requirements for that. Because if we think about from a networking perspective, there's different types of traffic. There's the management traffic, there's the compute traffic, i.e. the resources running on there need to go and talk out to various things. And then we're gonna do something very interesting with the storage. <clears throat> so traditionally, there's a separate storage network as well. Now there are solutions that don't require the storage network. You think of a switchless storage topology, but really the way that has to work is you have to get this mesh of connectivity direct between every single node. So as soon as you get past three nodes, it, it just becomes unwieldy. If we look at the requirements for the network, it talks about all of these. And here we can see exactly what I just said. So there's obviously the management traffic, the compute traffic, and then the storage traffic. And if you keep reading, it does talk, I think, later on about potential that you can do this without that storage network or storage traffic. There we go. But it, again, you're going to start to limit what you can do because then you're having to create this full mesh of connectivity. So realistically, most of the time, unless it's a fairly small cluster, the exact number of which may change depending on the vendor, again, <clears throat> most often there'll be a separate storage network. If it's very small, maybe I, I can do that switch list. So I mentioned we have one to 16 nodes. And once again, if we look at the system requirements, it does talk about the full requirements we have. I do need an Azure subscription. I do need certain permissions, which we're gonna talk about. Then the server requirements, what is the actual specification? So it does say a minimum of one to 16. 64-bit processors, it can be Intel or AMD, but it, the whole point is it has to be virtualization aware. I don't know if you can get a processor that isn't virtualization aware anymore. Again, 32 gigabytes of RAM is the minimum, but I, I can't see many people running virtualization even with that. It's probably gonna be a much higher than that. 
But you can go through and you can see all the different requirements around the storage, networking, etc. And notice it does require Active Directory. We'll, we'll talk about that, but it's joining your Active Directory domain. It is not joining Azure AD, it's joining Active Directory. And you'll see different vendors will support different configurations. Some will support single node, some maybe want two nodes, some will allow you to add more nodes to it, some may enable you to go from one node and then go to multi-node. You just need to really check what are my requirements and check with the vendors what is the one that I'm gonna use in my environment. So what is Azure Stack HCI? So it's a special operating system. So it's running the Azure Stack HCI operating system. So this is obviously built on Windows Server, but it incorporates a few other Azure learnings and optimizations um, that, are, that have been learned through the operation of this. So we can think about, well, we have the Azure Stack HCI operating system. It needs a hypervisor. It's gonna use Hyper-V. And then if we think about from a storage, it's hyper-converged. So there's no separate shared storage area network or NAS or anything else. They have local storage. But local storage is no good to me from a resilience perspective or I have workloads that needs to be able to move between them. I need to expose this as a shared storage subsystem. Well, that's where we use Storage Spaces Direct, S2D. So what Storage Spaces Direct does is using SMB and that storage network, basically what it creates is this idea of you put the disks into a storage pool and then I can create volumes that they're actually made up of the disk on each node, but I can access those volumes from all of the nodes. It looks like it's a, a shared volume, but it's actually using that local storage. So we use Storage Spaces Direct to create these cluster shared volumes that are made up of the local disks on each node. Then we're gonna want networking. So it's gonna be based on the Hyper-V switches, and then we can have abstracted software defined. So it's all software defined networking. And how we're using this. For the local management, it's using the Windows Admin Center. What we're gonna see is also what gets deployed down on this is Azure Arc, is a core piece of this. So Arc, that ARM control plane, the Azure capabilities are baked into it from day one. And all of this, doesn't matter what OEM you're using, this is Azure Stack HCI. It doesn't matter what vendor you're using, this will all be the same. Now again, Different vendors may then add on extra manageability. They may add on old GPUs, different qualities of storage, for example, NVMe, et cetera, et cetera, Flash. But these components, this is the Azure Stack HCI. They're always going to have Azure Stack HCI OS. They're always going to be Hyper-V. It's always going to be Storage Spaces Direct. It's always going to have Windows Admin Center. It's always um, software-defined networking, and it's always going to bring down Azure Arc. And maybe the best way is to go and look and actually see these components to make it make more sense. So let's actually go and look. And let's close these down. So I'm starting off in the Windows Admin Center. Now, in the Windows Admin Center, let's just go to the main capability here. I can see all the different connections, but I wanna look at my cluster manager. So these are all the clusters that we have available. And I'll just pick the first one. So we start with the dashboard. And what we can see with the dashboard, so I can see all my servers, I've got three servers in this cluster, all my drives are healthy. I can see it is connected, it is Arc enabled, it's got a certain Azure resource ID. I can see details. And again, this is just Windows Admin Center. There's nothing really special going on here. I can see details about the drives. 
I have in the machine. So I can see the overall drives. I'll, I'll come back to this in more detail. I can see inventory. I can see the servers, their performance. Again, inventory. I could go and manage the individual machines through Windows Admin Center as well, just by picking on one of them. I don't really want to do that at this point. There's a year of history in these things. But the key point here is with these servers, well, I can do manageability here. I can do things like I can pause them, resume them, remove, I can run capabilities such as a validate of the cluster. So you can see here, I've got validate cluster capabilities, view validation reports. I get details on the CPU, the memory, the OS builds. I can see all of the detail here. I can see the virtual machines that are on this cluster. Now, I can add them from here. That is not the key point, as we're gonna see. The point is I wanna do it through Azure, but just to see the capabilities. Yeah, there's, there's Gen 1, there's Gen 2. Notice the path is cluster storage. It's using the shared volumes for them. I can set details around virtual processes, etc. Within a certain VM, there's things like affinity rules. So I could have that anti-affinity to make sure they're not running on the same node. I could move them, I could move the storage, I could even domain join them, all without going into the OS at all. Their security capabilities I can see, so I could do things like secure boot, which would be enabled by default. So it has the full capabilities. If again I went back to the disks, we can see I've got 12 disks here, and they're broken up. I've got three nodes in this cluster, so we can see it's four disks per node. So we have 12 disks in total. And what you'll notice on the summary is you've got this recommended reserve of 21 terabytes. So this is all storage spaces direct, and the recommended reserve is based on the idea for the first four nodes, it wants to sacrifice one disk per node for spare capacity. So I have three nodes and the disks are seven terabytes. So three times seven is 21. So it's recommending leaving that. So if there was a disk failure or multiple disk failures, there's enough spare capacity so that it could reconstruct from the remaining disks. So it's like the old hot spare idea, except instead of just leaving the whole disk empty, it's leaving the equivalent amount of storage. So those are the disks. And then what it's doing, as I mentioned before, is putting them in all of them into a storage pool. And I think we can actually see that. So if we went back again, within here, you can see they're all in the same storage pool. So then I'm using storage spaces direct to create the volumes. So we can see the details of the volumes. And here what it does is one of them is used to store inventory data. One of them, in this case, because it's a Dell, they use one for their own purposes over there. There's a particular infrastructure volume. And then what it does is it's creating three baskets of cluster shared volumes. Now, you might say, well, why don't you just have one? It's all about that idea that you can still have logical corruptions and logical failures. So yes, technically I could have one big volume to store all my VM virtual hard disks and config in, but then if there was some kind of failure, I've lost everything. So instead it creates one for each of the nodes so that I can then separate. Now, again, they're accessible to all of the nodes. So VMs can still, just because a VM is in this one, I can use it from all three nodes. There's not a problem with that. It's just, it's different baskets. So if there was some logical corruption, if I had to repair a disk or restore whatever, hey, I've still got two thirds of my workloads up and running. So that's the only reason we have multiple of these is I just don't wanna create one massive volume because there are other types of failure beyond physical failure. There are logical corruptions, etc. So that's why we see that. Now for the actual resiliency of the volumes, you can see it's a three-way mirror. 
Now what you're gonna get here depends on the number of nodes. So I have three nodes, so the best it can do is a three-way mirror. If I had two nodes, it would be a two-way mirror. If it was four nodes, then it can start doing things with parity. So there would be different options. I can do fin provisioning, but then you risk over-provisioning, so that's, that's really down to the company whether or not you wanna do that. Encryption would use BitLocker. You'll notice there is also options around here for things like, hey, GPUs, and you can then split those GPUs so I can have discrete device assignment where it's dedicated to a particular VM for very, very high performance, AI and machine learning. I can share the GPUs so it's used across multiple VMs. I can partition as well as pass through. And I can even use this for things like Azure Virtual Desktop and AKS Pods. So it's really nice capabilities um, over there. So that's the, the basic structure. And of course there's networking obviously over there. I'm defining all of these, the virtual switches. I can see again in this case, I get the special Dell Apex integrations over there as well. So this is just showing you really the, the, the disks and the nodes that are based around this whole solution. Okay, how do I get it? Uh, I mentioned the process is you buy the boxes. So you purchase the boxes. Now most likely you're gonna buy these from a partner It will come pre-installed with the latest Azure Stack HCI OS on it, or you install it yourself. Then, once you have the box with the Azure Stack HCI OS, the first thing it actually has to do is join Active Directory. So each of the boxes, there is no cluster at this point. Each box, Active direct, so it is Active Directory Domain Services, i.e. the good old AD that comes with Windows Server, they all have to join Active Directory. Okay, so that's in a way step one. Step two is they do have to register with Azure because really the way we are licensing this, it's a, it's a consumption from an Azure subscription, so it has to build to a certain subscription. So the next thing you're gonna do, step two, is it's registering. So I need an Azure subscription, it's a resource group, I need a service principal in my entry tenant for it to do that registration. Now what always comes up is can it be air gapped? The answer is no. The maximum time it can go without talking is 30 days. Now that does mean technically, if I needed it uh, on a ship and it didn't have good internet, as long as it's docking every week or something, it would be okay. It tries to check in every 12 hours, but it will carry on working just fine for up to 30 days. Now after the 30 days, it won't stop working, but you'll be out of policy and I won't be able to create new VMs. So the existing ones would carry on, but I can't create anything new. And that's really the key point. And then once I've got this, what's now coming down onto this as we talked before, is this arc. Like the arc is built into it, so these will be lit up with arc. Like that, that's just a, a key part of everything it's doing. So arc is on these boxes. So great, I've got the nodes. Now what do I do? So at this point I've done no cluster, they're just boxes that have joined a domain and they're known to Azure. At that point, the actual creation of the cluster, you'll notice obviously I could do it through the Windows Admin Center, but that's not the model anymore. So if I go to Azure Arc, I can see all of the same machines, all of those boxes are available here. But what I actually now would do is if I go to Azure Stack HCI, I would go to Azure Stack HCI, and I'd be able to see those clusters, but I would do create. Now there's already videos, I'm not gonna go through a create process, but the point is I do the creation from here. I would tell it the nodes that I want to put into this cluster, so I would select the servers 
all mine are already in clusters, which is why I can't select any down here. But I would select the servers, and then all of the configuration I would do through Azure, which means I could do it through a template, PowerShell, all of the regular means. It will go and say, networks I want to use, the storage I want to use. It will deploy the resource bridge. It's just there by default. All I'm really doing is on premises, I just do enough to bootstrap the box so it's known to Azure, but then the actual steps, nearly everything else is done in Azure. So my step three, I would do up here. Hey, I want to create the HCI cluster. That is done in Azure. I'm not doing it in Windows Admin Center. Again, I showed you the Windows Admin Center to give you an idea of the base resources and what it is. Obviously, I can still use it, but the key point is now, the only bit I had to do locally was to get the OS, join it to the domain and register it. That's it. All of the fabric management, the networking, the storage here, all of the management is up here. It's all done through ARM. So I get a consistent experience. It doesn't matter if it's an Azure native cloud resource or an edge resource running on my Azure Stack HCI. I'm still doing everything. Even the fabric management of the Azure Stack HCI, I'm actually doing through Azure. So I would continue and drive everything through there. And then if I think of the resources, that works exactly the same way again. So if we go back over here, so that would be creating the cluster, but let's say I wanted to create a VM, well, I'll just do create an Azure Arc VM, and it would be a custom location. So remember I said my Azure Stack deployment, my Azure Stack HCIs, well, that's some of them right here. So these have been set with a custom location. I would just select them but then I'm still just deploying a VM through Azure. I can also do things like, again, through the Azure Arc, I could create a new AKS hybrid cluster, and I would just pick the custom location where I want to deploy that. So I'm gonna deploy AKS onto an Azure Stack HCI. So I'm doing it through Azure. And once I deploy that AKS, it just shows up as a regular Kubernetes service. They're just there. And then I can do all of the regular things that I could do with an AKS. I could do a deployment, I get all the capabilities there. So everything I want to do from that point on, all my resources, hey, I wanna add a new VM. Well, I do add VM up here. And it will go and create the VM down here. Hey, I need to go and add a new AKS cluster. I do it up in the Azure. And hey, it will go and create it over here. I do Azure Virtual Desktop. It will go and create it down here. And all of these resources will get lit up with Arc. So they'll all be Arc enabled as well. So it's not just the Azure Stack HCI is Arc enabled. All of these resources will also be Arc enabled. So now I've got Arc enabled Kubernetes which means, hey, that ARC capability to bring down database services, to bring down app services, to bring down machine learning, I can now bring those through the ARC capabilities. So the Azure Stack and ARC are really tied together. They complement each other very, very well. So I think about the Azure Stack HCI exposes lots of fabric capability. And then I can just build on that by using the ARC capabilities and that's consistent with everything else. And, and that's, that's the key point. It's now fully manageable. And, and this is the key point. Azure Stack HCI, as we saw both of the Kubernetes and the VM, is now just an extension of Azure. It's just another location that I can pick to deploy things to. Um, the patching, when I was, if I was to patch this, Again, it depends on the solution, but like the Premier solutions, which is what I'm using here, it would all be just through one patch experience. So if I go 
and let's go back. Just pick one. You'll see there's the idea of updates. And this update can be everything. The update can include, yes, the Azure Stack, the OS, but it could also be firmware. It can be BIOS. And again, it's jointly engineered and tested. So I don't have to do all these different things. From Azure, I can manage the patching and the health of everything all in that one place. And again, I think they show up in about four hours is the goal. So what's the pricing for this? I mentioned the whole point is I register it for, because it's a subscription, it's a consumption-based pilling. So I pay based on per core. So if we look, I'm paying a monthly fee per physical core per month. But there's also this ability, I can leverage my Azure hybrid benefit which can also extend if I want to run Windows Server guests. Normally, again, I would pay additional money per core. But again, with Azure Hybrid Benefit, it can be zero. So you need to check what licenses you currently have to see if I can leverage that, and then I, I don't have to pay where I'm already licensing um, these components. Now, other components may have their own prices. So things like the AKS, that also as a billing based on the virtual core. So here I can see it's 80 cents per virtual core per day. The Azure Virtual Desktop, I think is in preview at this time, so I don't think there's pricing available for it. But I'm basically, I'm, I'm extending Azure. I'm taking Azure capabilities and I'm bringing them to my edge. And so obviously there's a lot of investment and work goes in to create these services and so I'm paying, yes, I pay the hardware vendor for the box, but then I pay a subscription to then bring the Azure capabilities to those boxes. And so that's why it's that subscription model. So that's it. Um, I hope that explains what it is and why it is. It's there when I need that distributed edge solution. I don't think of it as a data center replacement as such. It's I might have tens, hundreds, thousands of these deployed through all my locations where I need because of latency, performance, sovereignty purposes, but I don't want a separate control or manageability. I want consistent management, consistent services with what I'm using in the cloud. And that's what the Azure Stack HCI gives me. I could create my own boxes, but there's also lots of partners around that provide managed and again, those different levels give you different levels of integration and supportability and partnering and engineering, obviously showing the Dell solution. But I think it's a phenomenal solution when I need those edge capabilities. And we talked about the retail, we talked about manufacturing, anywhere I need that edge capability, uh, these are a great fit for. So as always, I hope that was useful. Until next video, take care.